Good evening, everyone. I'm Nancy Netzer, the inaugural Robert L. and Judith T. Winston Director of the McMullen Museum and Professor of Art History at Boston College. I want to welcome all of you to this evening's panel discussion, which is part of the McMullen's Museum Current Series, organized by our Manager of Education and Outreach, Rachel Chamberlain. We want to thank her. Tonight, we have invited three directors of museums in Miami to share thoughts on how their institutions have responded to Latin American and Caribbean migration to their city. Professor of Hispanic Studies, Elizabeth Thompson Goitsueta, joins me as moderator of this discussion. Now, as many of you know, Professor Goitsueta is the curator of the McMullen's current retrospective on the Cuban artist Mariano Rodriguez, which will travel to the Perez Art Museum Miami in 2022. Over the past two decades, Professor Goitsueta has curated five other groundbreaking exhibitions at the McMullen as part of our Latin American initiative. Our three distinguished panelists this evening are Sylvia Carmen Cubina, Jill Dupi, and Jordana Pomeroy. Sylvia Carmen Cubina has been the executive director and chief curator of the Bass Museum since 2008. Prior to taking up her current position, she was the founding director of the Moore Space of Contemporary Art in Miami. And we're proud to say she received her BA in art history from Boston College. Jill Dupi has been the Beaux-Arts director and chief curator of the Low Art Museum at the University of Miami since 2014. And she received her BA from Mount Holyoke College, a JD from American University, an MA in art history from the University of London's Birkbeck College, and a PhD in art history from the University of Virginia. Jordana Pomeroy has been the director of the Patricia and Philip Frost Art Museum at Florida International University since 2015. She received her BA from Bryn Mawr College and her PhD in art history from Columbia University. I'd like to begin by thanking our panelists for being here this evening, by asking all of you to mute yourselves and to put any questions you might have for our panelists in the chat. And we'll start by asking each of our panelists to comment on how the Latin American Caribbean populations in Miami have changed since each of you became director of your museum and how you balance the community's diverse populations expectations for exhibitions, permanent installations and accompanying programs. I think we'll go first to you, Sylvia, as the, um, the person who has been the longest resident of Miami. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I think I'm going to go a little bit back, like a lot back, since when I arrived at the museum in 2008, because I think it's important to contextualize that in 1960, we had a very large wave of Cubans, as everybody knows. And for a few decades, the Cuban community was really um, sort of an establishment community in Miami and the largest by far. Latin American community in Miami-Dade County. And, and that was there for a very long time. I think in the recent, I would say two decades, um, that has changed a lot because we have had subsequent um, migrations of Venezuelans and um, Colombians and um, people from Central America, El Salvador, Nicaragua, um, and other, of course, other places in the Caribbean. Most recently, I think we've had waves from Puerto Rico in the last few years, ever since, you know, the, the hurricane and the financial um, issues there, the financial problems in Puerto Rico. So it really now is a huge, very diverse community of people, even when you look at the Latin American community. Mm -hmm. So that um, makes it richer and it makes it more complicated and it makes it challenging in a wonderful way. And I think that a lot of us take from this richness 
and our programs are responding to it in really different ways. So I'll speak very specifically about the BAS. We're in Miami Beach. It is it's still in the BAS, although we do have an enormous European community, enormous American Jewish community. We have we are my majority um, Latin American. And so what we do, because we have this very immediate audience um, also of tourists who come in, so that is a large audience for the BAS, is we integrate the Latin American um, programming in the larger context of a globalized world. And that is reflected by our exhibition program and our collection and our education program. So when we look at that, um, we look at Latin Americans not as a you know, large mass, we look at an artist from Mexico, an artist from Argentina, and many times the reasons why they're invited to show or to have a work at the BAS isn't that much their ethnicity, but the, um, the work and the conversation that they're bringing to our program. Um, I can keep going, but I think I need to give my colleagues some time. Um, I, I think that you had pointed out, Elizabeth, that when you came, you had seen the Lod Mosaic. Um, yes. Too. I, we're one of the few museums, I mean, obviously we're a university museum like the McMullen, so we, we tend to bring, we have a very sort of broad mission. We can really show anything, but we do tend to always want to uh, um, highlight, you know, artists who work locally. Um, we are in a university since um, maybe everybody on this call on the Zoom doesn't know anything about FIU, um, but it's it's a very, very large university, one of the 12 um, Florida public universities. It's a Hispanic serving uh, university. And for us, um, we learned that half of our visitors have never um, gone to an art museum before. So um, unlike the Bass, because it's geographically very different from where we are, um, we don't have much tour. We don't have many tourists. We don't have much tourism uh, in our neck of the woods. So that that tends to be less of a concern for us. But we do like to reflect the student body, um, the diversity of the student body, and, and I mean that in all um, in all ways that you define diversity. So we've had exhibitions on the Stonewall riots. We've had exhibitions on older trans generation. Um, and uh, so we're not specifically focused on Caribbean and South American art, but we do have quite a bit sort of sprinkled in. And did you want to comment at all on how it's changed in the time that you've been there? How the programming is changed? Yeah, how your population or your well, audience has changed? Our, I, I, our audience has changed. Be, well, there are two things. One is we were when I got there, everybody said we were very far away from everything. Miami's changed. It's 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 grown so that the western part of Miami is, is quite you know populated. We used to be a very in a very rural area, and you, you know I'll still have you know, people come say I just you know the university used to just be like it was one building. I mean it's rapidly grown. So I think that the museum the new building that we're in, which opened in 2008, signified and signaled, you know, a brand new university. Like every, every great university has a great museum. So that was really the change happened in 2008. And under this, you know, president, um, you know, it's the university's expanded. There's, so there are many, many more people generally, you know, coming to take classes. And, you know, we have, a, you know, the student body has has um, just expanded exponentially every year. Um, so that's that's really the difference. Thank you, Jill. My, my colleagues have done a wonderful job of, of setting the stage. So um, I thank them and I thank you, Elizabeth, Nancy, and uh, Rachel for inviting me to be here this evening. So the Lowe is also an academic art museum. That means that our parent organization is a university, in this case, the University of Miami. And we are lodged in not only their campus, but in the city of Coral Gables. So we also do not have a tremendous amount of tourist foot traffic, but we do have a lot of lifelong learners, K-12 groups coming from the city of Coral Gables itself, as well as surrounding communities. And of course, uh, more than 50% of our audiences are faculty and students from the university. And the student body, 
as well as the faculty actually reflects the diversity of our community. And that I have seen only increase over the seven years that I have been here. I think to me, what's been most interesting, particularly since the pandemic or the onset of the pandemic rather, and um, after the murder of George Floyd in particular has been this heightened awareness of identity and not identity on block. And this is kind of what I think Jordana was alluding to as well as Sylvia in terms of, of this, this um, very diverse community in which we live. So there are clear populations, clear segments of, of ethnicities and cultural identities, but everyone really is, is as Sylvia was saying in terms of the artists that they select, uh, valued and, and values themselves for the very unique and um, rich you know, identity that is, is theirs and solely theirs. So we are also very careful to like Jordana, because we have a, a very broad mission. Uh, our mission is exploring contemporary culture through 5,000 years of human creativity on every inhabited continent. So it is really broad and wonderfully expansive in that way. But we also try to be quite mindful of making sure that we're covering a, 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 a quite wide swath of, of that cultural diversity of humanity writ large. Um, so I would say that the change that I have seen has again, not only been a, a, an augmentation of the diversity, but also um, a heightened and appropriately so sense of, of um, unique individual identities, including Latin, Latin American, and of course the wider Caribbean basin as well. That is so great. Thank you all three of you for, for those Kind of parameters and feedbacks. I th feedback. I think we have um, very different universities with some overlapping concerns, and and one of the overlapping uh, commonalities, I would say, more than a concern, would be, of course, the Latin American population that you're dealing with. So, Sylvia, just to follow up on your comment, I think um, it's very true, especially for shall we say, populations like ours up in Boston that are just beginning to kind of understand through our efforts at the McMullen Institute, the uh, Latin American Initiative at McMullen Museum, you know, that there is this reality that you pointed out, which is that, you know, there are Mexicans and there are Argentinians and there's the Caribbean art and within the Caribbean art, there's specific, you know, specificity within that. So um, as the only one on the panel who is a Latina, um, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of curious if the fact that you are a female Latina director, does that kind of make you have more of a proclivity to, for programming around the Latin American and Caribbean reality that you have seen and expressed so well in terms of changing and, and really kind of morphing with this diversity within Latin America. Can you speak to that? Um, I think the short answer is no. Um, and then the longer, very complicated answer is, I mean, I guess I can speak Spanish and I'm bicultural that way. Right. So it's really hard to gauge what that even means, if it means anything, if it allows for me to, you know, establish some sort of connection. I'm not sure about that answer, but I've never sort of, I, I, I don't think about that that much. And I think that one of the things that, that I try to push forth is mm -hmm. what are the commonalities and subject matters and in different sort of concerns that are not nationalist, especially mm -hmm. in this globalized world mm -hmm. where a lot of us, you know, whether, you know, I think you were asking me before, so are you from Puerto Rico, but you know, Cuban parents, all of that. And I, you know, we keep answering, it's complicated, it's complicated. And mm -hmm. our kids are even answering, well, it's really complicated. Right. They're adding, you know, all sorts of, you know, emphatic words to that. So I think that we look at the commonalities. I want to give one example of one of the last shows that we had at the Bass. Um, um, by the way, the Bass, our concentration is contemporary art. And we do, you know, as much cutting edge and installation and commissioned work. So in essence, we, when we talk to artists, we say, okay, what is your wildest dream and how can we make it come true? And that's kind of, we partner with um, artists to make, you know, installations site specific and, and things that require partnerships to make. 
Um, and a lot of the conversations are, and I want to point to Hey Yu Yang, which was the last show that we had before um, COVID um, closure. She's an artist um, from Korea. And one of the things that I realized immediately, she was an artist that I was interested in showing was because she talks about being a Korean living in Berlin and always feeling displaced. And that displacement, mm -hmm. cultural displacement somewhere was something that is, it, all, her work was all about it. So for me, it was really, you know, what artists can we find elsewhere to create conversations that are unique and not very common and not that much about Latin America, but more about the world and, and establishing sort of those bridges that, you know, that we can serve to establish. And um, uh, oddly enough, her um, exhibition was called In the Cone of Uncertainty because she wanted to talk about weather and she wanted to talk about what was she doing showing in Miami. And um, one of the questions that she asked me when in our first conversation about the exhibition was, what do people in Miami have in common? And of course I blurted out nothing because we're so diverse. Mm -hmm. And then we got to talking and we realized we have hurricanes in common. And that's how the whole, that's how the whole exhibition conversation started. Well, and I think, you know, to your point, um, I think being bilingual, bicultural, uh, displaced, um, these are human experiences, right? And those are commonalities for everyone. And so, um, you know, when we exist in this global world, when you refer to your children about it being even more complicated, it's true. That's kind of the human experience of everybody today, because we have these mixes and then we have marriages with mixes and mixed people and then we have off springs that inherit those experiences so really it's about commonality of experiences and how we can kind of focus on that yeah so um so that there's a lot there for for contemplation and and for exploration um I think for all of our museum directors, I think that's what you all do so brilliantly in your positions is to kind of highlight those experiences for your, for your populations. Jordana, I just wanted to turn to something that you had said, you know, I was so struck when I came to visit you for the first time at the museum and I saw this exhibit on the Roman mosaics and I thought knowing full well that FIU is indeed a university that caters to 64% uh, enrollment of Hispanics. And it's this huge enrollment. I think you have like 55,000 students. And here in, 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 you know, following up on what Silvio was saying, here's the opportunity for these visitors as you were commenting fully, I think half of your visitors, you said, had never been to a museum. And you have this experience to say, not only is it about our experience, but it's about experience of others and experience of others, you know, centuries ago, millennials ago. And, and where to find the commonality in that is, is very exciting. Well, so, you know, if you remember with the mosaic, we, we actually focused a lot on the subject matter, which had to do with uh, marine life. And what could be a more perfect connection to Miami? Um, I, I learned a lot about marine life, you know, in classical antiquity from our marine biologist who came by and was working with us. It's one of the ways we choose our shows is how can we create the best opportunities for faculty to um, to participate and engage. Um, you know, it's 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 not there's it's it's quite a trick to get faculty to. So they sort of drop what they are used to doing and uh, engage with the works, engage with the exhibitions. And I think there's the, um, uh, you know, these kinds of opportunities, you, you have to find the connection, say, but Mike, this is what you can talk about with this mosaic. T tell me about these weird fish that I'm seeing, you know? And it was, so it was really, um, it was interesting. In that particular show also, I had taken the, the texts, which were written, uh, they were written at, for, at the University of Pennsylvania in their, in their um, uh, I guess their archaeology museum. For, so they were meant for, you know, people who are inclined to archaeology. 
And I was reading this and thinking, nobody, nobody's going to understand this. So let's, we have to tell stories. So we do try to do that with, we, with our exhibitions. We brought a collection of art from the Ringling when they were undergoing renovation of that focused on women in um, mythology and uh, and also in the Bible. And we called it Dangerous Women. And we decided that, that there's a lot of there's a lot of connections there too between these. Um, uh, the seductive women of the of the Bible and and Miami's um, a notorious uh, reputation for um, you know very uh, dangerous women. <laughs> dangerous women. How should I say that? You know, uh, yeah. the, the sort of uh, emphasis on looks and and right. uh, and that was that was successful because of those stories. Otherwise, I never would have been able to pull people in to see that show. It was not full of Rembrandts, and it was just full of like sort of artists that probably even if you are a Baroque uh, uh, specialist, you might not know these artists, but it became an interesting show because of that. And that's the fun part, of course, about being, about curating, you know, is that you get to tell stories and that's, that's the accessibility, that's the portal is through those stories. And I think that the students and the visitors really appreciate that. That's what, that's what draws them in and helps them make those intellectual connections and experiential connections, which at the very basic level is what we try to do at museums, mm -hmm. is try to connect. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really our, our job, especially in the university museum field, is to make, is to make students connect and engage faculty. And you know, this is, this is our, our primary constituency. Right, right. No, it's, it's very true. We do that at Boston College. And I saw Nancy have a big smile on her face when you said, you know, we want to tell stories because she's always hammering that to all the curators. We've got to have a narrative, you know, we've got to really show what is the narrative. So, but having the, the opportunity to actually tap into the resources of faculty and, and their specialties is really a, a unique position to be in. So um, I think Jill, you've, you've probably seen that at the low as well, being able to tap yeah. into this kind of wealth of knowledge, but engaging those faculty members as well into the, into the show, into the exhibition. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I love talking about in terms of what sets the low apart from other museums in town, with the exception of Jordana, of course, because she's also a nested institution, is that we have access to this incredible brain trust. Um, so whether it's a, a, a neurological surgeon or a, to continue Jordana's marine sciences metaphor, one of our marine biologists or an art historian, it's really exciting for us to be able to rely on those different um, uh, areas of, of expertise and specialization. And I find it particularly exciting, and Jordana also alluded to this with the fish, to work with um, faculty as well as students who think that there's really nothing here for them. So that, was, that would really be the STEM disciplines mm -hmm. um, in particular. There's a lot of magic that can happen in those interstitial spaces. Um, and and I, love, I love this conversation because all of the words that you all are using are all of the words that we're talking about and using and thinking about here all of the time, portals, bridges, um, you know, storytelling, which is what museums truly excel at doing. And I think to kind of go back to, to the topic, one of the things that we're really leaning into with, with our Latinx um, audiences, as well as other audiences, is this idea of co-creation, which Sylvia also alluded to in terms of her work with, with artists. And we're trying to do that, not necessarily just with artists, but also with, with um, students, faculty, and also visitors. So we have, we have um, uh, an app, which you can find online called Hidden Stories, New Voices, that allows people to respond um, in real time uh, to our crest collection of European Renaissance and Baroque. So church art as one student so aptly called it. And that's when, when the scales fell from my eyes. And I realized that just because I'm a scholar of the 18th century in Italy and understand the lexicon and find it in interesting doesn't mean that, that everyone else does. So I think that that for us at least is one of the keys to, to, um, to helping to make individuals 
from our community, across our community, including um, Latin American uh, individuals feel welcome and feel like this is really their museum. And that means they have to see themselves in the art and also in the text and in the programming. And I will confess that, that we're just getting started and it's not easy. And I say that not because we don't want to share. It's not easy because it takes um, a whole lot more time to do it well. And it also takes um, greater resources. So again, we're learning as we go, but I do think that that, that for us is the future. I also think that frankly, it's the future of museums that are, are under a lot of scrutiny at the moment, M much of it justified if I, if, I may, if I may be so frank. Well, and also the, you know, a yes, you may. And the, your point about um, diversity in the increased diversity uh, where you are and your, your particular museum is located, which you said is in Coral Gables, which is a highly residential section as well, and you have these lifelong learners, and you have visitors that would probably more wander into um, your museum and and find the breadth and depth that a university museum can afford. Um, so, in terms of um, the that kind of increase of diversity that you've seen, I've noticed my own experience with uh, your museum is you've um, not only shown um, Latin American artists and, and some, of course, specifically Cuban artists, which is, I'm not saying exclusively, I'm saying that you have represented in addition to other Latin American artists, Cuban artists, which is of interest to me as, as well as the Latin Americans. Um, but I think what you've done, which is really interesting to me, is connect these Cuban artists to this Pan-American and avant-garde currents that are happening globally. So it's not just like, I look like this, I self-identify as a Cuban and I'm gonna see uh, Diago or I'm gonna see Carlos Esteves, but also how, what is the conversation like at that point and what are those conversations like globally and what have they been up to that point? So can you speak a little bit about this kind of transnational and international connection that you, that I, it appears to me you're trying to make? I don't yeah. know if you're projecting. No, you're not. I mean, it is part of, part of the broader mission. Um, we, we see ourselves, and this is a word that Sylvia, I think, used as, as a builder of bridges or a facilitator of bridges, both across time, but also across space and place. And I feel that space and place are not necessarily the same things. Mm -hmm. But we also don't want to be prescriptive. Nothing, nothing. Um, uh, I, I find it, as a woman, I find it troubling um, when, when, with the exception of a show like Jordana's, you know, I think, you know, there's a, there's a reason to talk about dangerous women because it was so uncommon for women to be professional artists at that period, at that time. But when you're dealing with contemporary art or near contemporary art, and you're still, you know, focusing on the, the gender of the artist. I think that that is completely counterproductive. And I find the same thing too, if we talk about Cuban, Cuban artists here, which is one of our clear foci, uh, both today and for our future, our vision for the future. Uh, and I, I really look to the artists, how they define themselves, not just in terms of their um, cultural identity, uh, but also where they see themselves in the, in the broader panorama. Um, I think that that um, both Carlos Estevez and Diago are excellent cases. You know, Carlos mm -hmm. Estevez really sees himself as a contemporary artist, full stop. He just happens to have been born in Cuba and now lives in a Cuban American experience. And similarly, Diago, um, based in Havana, uh, very much of the island, is looking to a broader, more global context. Um, as well in his art. And I would just note that that show actually surprised me because of the history of kind of fraught politics as regards the island in particular. I had been warned to, ex uh, to expect some blowback uh, showing the, the work of an artist who lives full-time in Cuba. And I was, I was um, really pleased actually that, that nary a word, at least publicly, was said about our decision to show his art. And again, we were showing his art because we believe in, in 
Diago the artist, Diago, Diago the person, not to make a political statement. And I think that that really, for me, is what, what art and art museums are about. It's, you know, we are, we are um, facilitators of conversations. We are, we are impresarios in a very real way, uh, dealing with, with artists, both um, living and deceased. And of course, that's one of our current challenges at the McMullen as well, because Mariano was a supporter of the revolution, stayed with the revolution, died in 1990. So, you know, our attempts with this exhibition, uh, probably much like your attempts, is not to make a political statement with what he uh, undoubtedly, you know, supported or didn't support. The facts are there for themselves. But we are here to look at the aesthetic um, value of the production of this artist and to um, trace that evolution and to enter into a dialogue about the merit and worth of the art itself, as opposed to the artist and as opposed to political beliefs, et cetera. It's, it's not that it's mutually exclusive because it all is part and parcel of the experience that Mariano had or that Diago has, or, you know, and, and, and do we make an artificial um, kind of distinction between a Cuban artist on the island and the Cuban artist off of the island? So these are all questions that we're all grappling with. And our intent is to show one uh, artist to, who contributes to the conversation uh, the deep conversation that we have on human kind and what that experience is. So um, these are these are tricky times and, and tricky waters uh, that we're dipping into, yeah. and certainly. Um, say, um, Elizabeth, uh, that that you bring up and that this conversation has made me think about is just how different what we're doing at the McMullen with the kinds of shows that we do with the Latin American Initiative is to what you're doing in Miami. We're, we're picking individual artists and introducing them to a public um, for the first time. None of these artists has ever had um, a, a solo exhibition, as far as I can tell, in the, in the whole of the Northeast. Um, and so you're, you're showing a number of your artists, I'm assuming, against a backdrop of lots of galleries um, that are showing similar works uh, or works of many of the same artists and a whole community that's familiar with these names and these artists. Uh, so it's a very different, it's, it's a very different um, response that I suspect we're eliciting than that which you, you're you receiving. And I was really surprised and pleasantly surprised um, that our local public television station was so excited about this show um, and that they pitched it to the PBS National News Hour and it was on the National News Hour. And I just wonder if that exhibition, the same exhibition had been in Miami, if it would have elicited that kind of response. Well, you'll soon find out, right? Isn't it traveling to Pam next in a yeah. slightly expanded scale? But I think your point is well taken, Nancy, that I would be shocked if PBS, the local PBS station jumps on the bandwagon um, because it just will be received differently here. Not in a lesser or a better yeah. way, but just in a different way. Yeah. And, and you have to think about, I mean, we're, we are borrowing a um, series of Rembrandt prints because that's not something you will ever see down here. You know, this is, I mean, the, it's a 180 from Boston. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have old collections and, and yeah. you know, this is Rembrandt prints. You know, we just saw that last week, you know, I mean, so everything <laughs> like this. One of those shows? <laughs> So it's that's, it's that's really true. the young, young, Absolutely. young, young institutions. And we also have to look, I think, to the audiences. Um, it's not only that here in Miami, you have other Cuban artists that are being shown, but the audiences that are seeing these things. And so in Boston, 
they'll see a Cuban artist as something like we would see the Rembrandts mm -hmm. here, which would be, you know, extremely unique and something that you would, that would stand out. And I think as long as the artist um, either self-identifies or is okay with putting out that the person's Cuban or Cuban American and it's part of the, their practice, I think it's, it's quite okay. Mm, absolutely. And I think, I mean, these points are so well taken because the, what well, as Nancy has said, we're trying to do is to introduce people to uh, very well-known artists such as Wifredo Lam or Roberto Mata lesser known artists such as Rafael Soriano, which for your audience is very well known, but for our audience is lesser known. Um, and I think Wifredo Lam and Roberto Mata had, you know, the surrealism content and had more of a global exposure. And so those were names that kind of tripped off their tongues, but also Esteban Lisa from Argentina, who is unknown in the Latin American um, concrete world. So, um, or lesser known, I would say, um, and has not been exhibited enormously, um, but has been exhibited in, in, of course, Spain, out in California. Um, uh, he's, uh, he's being exhibited right now in Toledo, España, as well as Madrid, uh, in Boston. Uh, and, and, you know, in New York, there have been uh, galleries that have had shows on him. So, you know, it's, it's this kind of mixing. And what I find uh, really wonderful is to dip my toe into Miami and go down there and find the wealth that you guys bring to these conversations on Latin American artists or on Cuban artists or on the whole field as you know, part and parcel of this kind of global um, conversation that we're having. So I go down to Miami and uh, I just get my uh, gasoline into my tank with all of the uh, feedback and all of the uh, expressions and contemplations that you guys have had much more time to develop. Whereas, you know, we are introducing people in, uh, to our audience here in the Northeast and trying to make that a departure point for them for learning about, as Silvia said, you know, Latin American art is not just Mexico and it's not just Argentina and Caribbean art is not just Cuban. There's Haitian art and there's all kinds of different expressions. And, you know, as Jill was saying, I think it's important that that diversity when people go into museums that they see themselves reflected you know on the walls and that another component i think that is so important to these museums is we provide so much magic for people i know that a lot i had a student when uh she saw the the wifredo ram exhibition and she saw a whole section devoted to santeria and she said oh my gosh you know my aunt practices Santeria, she's a Santera, but I always hid this from my friends, but now I see it's worthy of scholarship and now I'm proud of it. And now I want to learn more about this artist and I want to learn more about this field of study. And so, you know, that, that kind of uh, connection where we're able to connect with people on intellectual levels, experiential levels, uh, uh, all types of levels is so intrinsic to the museum experience. But I think a lot of it is narrative and a lot of it is magic. And, and that's probably why we got PBS <laughs> because the painting is beautiful. You know, the painting that Mariano is doing is beautiful or the paintings that Jordana you have in the, the studio class that you have, you know, that Wendy did is, is just, extraordinary and that's exciting you, you just brought up a lot i was just thinking i mean museums now as we speak are changing their their narratives and think about when when you know i went to graduate school uh, or even undergraduate um which is starting to feel ancient history but it's really only a few decades ago i we didn't talk about women we didn't talk about latin american art and everything was eurocentric and that was the case pretty much 
until very recent times, you know, yeah. so, and museums move glacially. So we are now seeing, I know, I, I saw a feature on the Seattle Art Museum, how they're changing, the, you know, they're changing the way they display works to create global conversations. And I think it's really important for us too to always try to stay relevant. What strikes me about being at a university museum is if I follow the students, I'll, I'll be a better director. In other words, there's a sense of fluidity in all, you know, all ways about not defining oneself. I am this, I am that. In fact, they look at us cross-eyed mm -hmm. start talking about these things. Like, mm -hmm. you know, this is so true. You know, acceptance of gender orientation, mm -hmm. of being trans, of, um, you know, I'm, I'm, what does that even mean to be Latin American? What does it mean to be, of, you know, there's just a lot of conversation that mm -hmm. we're having at our level that in a, in a funny way, they've already had, they've been born into it, you mm -hmm. know, and, um, and their expectation is that we will, we will um, speak out history that way. And the other thing I want to point out is interesting is that um, if Sylvia has worked, her, her career has been in contemporary art. And then Jill and I are like these, you know, historians of old art, you know, and it's something about that too, which makes the bass very fun. And I think it's very much more, I think Sylvia has a lot of, you know, I always get the sense of a lot of fun at the, at the bass. I mean, um, there's a well, clarity on that. Well, I have a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I still have a lot of fun. And I think that still have a lot of fun is a good thing. It, you know, it's so, um, two things of, and I've been hearing you and I first of all I heard your introductions with all those PhDs and all those wonderful degrees which is so different when you're leading um, a, a university museum when you're leading a civic museum it's almost like you're running a business more so and I don't consider myself a scholar by any means um, almost kind of consider myself a business person and I, when I think about the museum and I think about what we do, it is a business in a sense that, you know, it, it, we have an audience, which are your clients and, you know, you have to um, produce anyway, produce these things and raise the funds and all of that. And I think because you run a civic museum, you have a more complicated audience in a way because you, you can't pinpoint it. It's a little bit more, um, it's a little, it's very general. We happen to have tourists and we have the residents and, you know, of Miami Beach. So I don't, we don't have the students to sort of push back and, and to push back against what we do. So it's a little bit amorphous out there when we think about it. Thankfully, we have a very young staff who is, um, you know, kind of shocks me into new ways of thinking, which really help a lot. Um, but I was also thinking about, um, I was actually tickled pink when Elizabeth was talking about, you know, the well-known artists like Wilfredo Lam. Um, when I was there a few decades ago at Boston College, I told my um, advisor that I wanted to do my final project on an artist who's not well-known at all. His name is Wilfredo Lam. Mm -hmm. And I found two books and he didn't know who the, um, the artist was. And he said, you know, I wanna do an experiment. Let's go to the cafeteria and all of the professors, all of the entire art history department was sitting at one table. And we're going to ask everyone if anybody knows who Wilfredo Lam was and nobody knew. Wow. So um, I'm really happy to hear, you know, it, the name rolling off of Elizabeth's tongue. That's great. Well, it's amazing what a couple of decades will do, right? And <laughs> A few and, more than a couple, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go there. But now you, you'll have to come back to our art library. And because of the exhibition, there's a lot, there are a lot of books and a lot of scholarship and we've contributed some as well. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful journey. And, and it's been so wonderful to have this opportunity at the McMillan Museum to kind of um, showcase something that was not Eurocentric as Jordana was mentioning. I mean, when I came here, I came from Chicago and Chicago was very much uh, involved with Latin American art um, and, um, you know, not only Mexican art, but also uh, from 
the Caribbean, from all of Latin America. Um, so it's wonderful to see how this evolves. And I go back to Jordana's comment about museums and change and, and the glaciers. And it is slow, but it's massive. And I think right now the changes that are happening within the museum world are massive. And I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I just got back from um, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and I visited, I made a quick trip to the Gibbs. And, you know, in the deep south, in an area that was um, a uh, primary uh, area for uh, slave, the slave trade. Um, I mean, you know, it, it was a uh, primary area. It was, it was the market for the slave right. trade. And I noticed um, how well they had addressed, confronted, you know, hit the history that was inherent in their collection you know, these endless portraits of, of um, uh, white slave holders and really sort of talked about it in, in labels. Um, it, was, it wasn't simply we're going to show this Black artist. We are going to really talk about enslaved people and where the money comes from. And it was, I was, I was, I was impressed. I was surprised. Um, you know, and it was a demonstration of maybe we aren't as glacial as I accused our profession of being. Yeah, especially in the last year and a half, we've been really pushed into getting out of that glacial um, sort of mentality and pace. We've been pushed to become really creative on how we were going to present ourselves without buildings and without traditional audiences and going online and and thinking about diversity and talking about diversity in ways that we had never done. And, and to have to move very fast on a lot of things and take a lot of risk. One of the things that um, I've been thinking about a lot in the past, I don't know, year, or I don't even know, you know, time has been a little bit warped in the last um, 18 months, but I've been thinking about diversity, but I've also been thinking about inclusion. We have a very diverse staff at the museum and, and a very diverse board. And one of the things that um, we're coming up against is there's a pushback and there are rules that somebody has set about diversity. And now you're trying to very tidily sort of, you know, superimpose that onto your museum and all of a sudden, that no, no, your diverse group is pushing back and saying, you want diversity, you get diversity, but now inclusion starts, which means we get to have a say on what this looks like. And it's really, really complicated. How do you bring people from different cultures to expect them to behave in a way or think in a way or do in a way is really just goes out the window. So I'm having a lot of thinking about that. I don't have any articulated thoughts yet, but I, at least I have a path forward. Jill, you've spoken a little bit about diversity. I think we're gonna give you the last word on the on that for the evening. Can you follow? Uh, and sure, well, I'll try, because uh, I think that Sylvia um, has expressed so eloquently what the challenges we're all facing. Um, so when, when things started to shift and change so dramatically in our society for the intertwined crises through which we were still living, I was thinking a lot about the power of power. And I think that at the end of the day, that's the fundamental issue with museums is acknowledging our power and being willing to let go of a whole lot of it. And that goes back to co-creation on a kind of very real and um, pragmatic level. But I think that to Sylvia's point, we've spent a whole lot of time in, in um, Zoom meetings, whether it's AAMD or AAMG or fill in the acronym and together just talking one-on-one -on -one about we, how we can have, how we can make meaningful change both individually and institutionally. But to me, again, I think that the key is acknowledging that power and finding, um, finding real mechanisms for letting go. And Sylvia, I think you're absolutely correct that diversity, equity, and access, uh, as well as inclusion are not the same as belonging at all. And that 
is also, I think, one of the keys for me, at least in my practice as a director, is to incorporate belonging, not as a box to be ticked, but into the very fabric of everything we do here. So lots of challenges ahead, <laughs> lots of challenges. But, you know, I'm, I, I do think that the, the epidemic has forced us to really confront a lot of issues and helped us to slow down in a certain way so that we can ask those questions and can contemplate some possible solutions, which maybe is the silver lining. Uh, it's been a very difficult time, but I think in a certain way, the visual arts were able to respond in a way that perhaps other art fields were not able to do. Um, you know, we were able to go online, but you couldn't go to a symphony or you couldn't go to, you know, many uh, a theater presentation. So um, I think, you know, back to the glacier <laughs> analogy, we are slow moving, but um, I do think that there is a movement, a unified movement that is being embraced, not only in museums, but in scholarship. And, and it's, there's almost like a groundswell as Jill and Sylvia were saying, where the impetus is coming from below. It's coming from the visitors, it's coming from the students, it's coming from the tourists, it, you know, it's coming from the experience of living in society. And when we're all in that together. So um, I, I do think it's been a slow pace, but I think there is a glacial you know, movement and it's large and it's happening. So you're all part of it. So thank you all. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat, but I'm wondering if there are, are any of our um, participants this evening um, who were who would like to unmute and um, and ask a question. Anyone who is interested in uh, asking something of our panels? I'll just I'll just fill the time just to um, specify that the Mariano show will come down at the end of this semester in at Boston College. Um, it it finishes on December fifth, and then it will travel to Pam. It will actually be a little bit of a smaller show instead of a larger show. Um, so we're, we uh, were able to, at Boston College, we have almost 6,000 square feet with the two galleries. And we were able to show a lot of works on paper to kind of trace the evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these bocetos, these studies uh, that we had for a lot of the oil paintings. But um, we're so excited to have it at PAM. It will open in August of 2022, and it will stay up for a much longer run uh, until January of 2023. So um, we'll all have to go and see it together and continue our conversations. And uh, we're delighted that it's going to be in Miami. So we'll keep you posted. Thank you. Looking forward to having it. Well, it thank remains you. for me to thank our panelists. Um, for enlightening all of us. Um, this has been a wonderful discussion. I certainly have learned a lot. Um, and I'm looking forward to coming back down to Miami and visiting all of your museums and um, continuing our discussion. Um, and it'll be interesting, probably when, when we get there, um, your, um, your audiences and your, your ideas about how you serve them will probably continue to have changed. Um, so you may be in a slightly different place at that moment. Um, so thank you all and um, congratulations on, on your wonderful work. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank, you, very thank you for inviting us. Thank you for coming. We, we really enjoyed the conversation and good luck uh, with Art Basel. Thank you. Thank we luck. need it. See you soon. <laughs> Take care. So we Thank you. Thank you.